What's up, everyone? Today we are joined by none other than Anne Gael Chastels. I get the feeling I'm pronouncing her name really wrong, but I wanted to have her introduce herself and give us a bit of background information on what she has been up to. So let's listen to that before we jump into the whole episode. So, hi, um, my name is Angel Schall. I'm uh, working at IBM, uh, especially in the AI fields. Um, and I'm here to talk about uh, AI and ethics, AI and inclusion, AI and regulation, all those really hot topics that I like. And thanks for uh, having me, Demetrius. All right, cool. So if this is your first time here listening, Are You a Robot? podcast, video cast is something that we have put together that really is challenging the greatest questions that come to mind when we are looking at artificial intelligence and related technologies. The way that we're doing this is we're getting the smartest people that we can find to come on here and talk with me about what they're doing, how they see things, and if they've found any best practices. Really, when I say best practices, it's interesting because we've started a Slack community that I really encourage you to join if you are at all interested in any of this. And as a community, we're trying to bring together some of the best practices, some of the things that we've all been learning. Because as you, I'm sure, know if you're tuning in, AI and machine learning is relatively new and it is eating up more and more of our lives as we go on. Day by day, it's becoming more important that we start looking at these ethical issues and this governance. So today we get to talk with Anne, but before we jump into the conversation, I want to give a big shout out to our sponsors, Ethics Grade. They are absolutely incredible. If it weren't for them, we wouldn't be here right now and we would definitely not be having the high caliber of guests that we have been getting on. So thank you to Ethics Grade. If you want to know more about them, they're an ESG benchmarking firm that specializes in technology governance. And you can check out a link below for both the Slack and more information on Ethics Grade. Without further ado, let's jump into it. Anne was an absolutely incredible guest, and I love what she was able to bring to this podcast. So here we go. Are you a robot? Perfect. Thank you for coming on here. I am really excited to talk to you about so many different pieces of this puzzle, as you said, in AI ethics, AI regulation. And I know that IBM is really doing some interesting things that I want to dig into deep. But before we do any of that, maybe it would be good to hear a little bit of how you ended up where you are, because you don't have the normal trajectory of someone who is in the position that you're in. And, and can you give us just a breakdown of what is your position right now? What does that mean? What do you do? And how did you get there? So uh, my, my position at the moment, I'm a chief of staff to the uh, French president for IBM. Uh, so a bit far from AI right now. Um, but in my position, I'm really in charge of the transformation uh, of the, 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 the company, our organization. Um, and so, uh, and putting the, the human at the very center uh, every time I can. <laughs> Mm. So, um, and so my uh, favorite topic of uh, inclusion, uh, transformation, constant learning, innovation uh, is uh, also at the core of my uh, current job. But uh, before that, uh, and from uh, 2015, I've started to work with AI and started to the very first project, AI uh, project in France. On, uh, with very large companies, and then uh, in the UK as well. Um, for on, uh, on both sides, both on the development side and also on the consulting side on AI strategy for large companies. So you said that you're very focused on keeping human-centered design. What does that mean to you and how are you doing that? Um, 
so uh, maybe I can say that I have a double academic background. Uh, mm. I went to a business school for man- with management and finance major, and I'm also a psychotherapist and uh, have a major degree in coaching and, uh, psych- and psychology. So with um, both um, profile, I must say, uh, and that's something also that um, is key for me in the AI project is to use this tool uh, to ease our life, to um, innovate, propose new services, new products sometimes, but always to what we say at IBM is augment, augment people, not replace people. And that's how I keep human at the center uh, of the uh, the technology uh, approach. Yeah, I mean, you were mentioning it before we started recording, but the idea of making sure that jobs are not lost by AI, they're just uh, augmented, I think is a great term for that. And it's something that we've brought up many times on this podcast, especially when it comes to the idea of, uh, as you know, uh, you probably saw the guitar behind me, that I'm a musician and AI is starting to make a lot of music these days and it's kind of buzz worthy and so the topic of well are AIs going to replace musicians Mm. but there's a lot of really interesting things that are happening where AI it's not replacing the musicians but it's augmenting the musicians abilities and so you have this sync that happens with the computer and the human that is allowing them to do new things. And if you look at just a very basic form of that is like electronic music, right? It's no longer uh, some instrument that we have in our hands that we play. It's through the key or through the um, computer. Mm. But that's a bit of a tangent. We didn't come here to talk about that. I just really enjoy that idea of augmenting instead of totally replacing. Mm. So... We wanted to dive into IBM's ethics a little bit and what is happening with IBM. And I I was wondering, maybe we could start with just their ethos and how they maintain this trust of the people. Because I, for some backstory, and we'll link this in the description, I watched the video on very cool research happening at IBM Mm -hmm. on different pieces of AI. And what I wanted a bit of clarification on, and you already gave this to me, but it might be good to give to the readers, was how when this AI tool is being created and it's collecting all of this data, how do you maintain trust between IBM and the customer? Yeah, so um, as we discussed, IBM is only uh, a B2B company. We are not selling to consumer directly. We propose services for our client to sell or propose services to to the consumer. So, and in our approach, and um, and that's from from the, the beginning. This is a, a core. This is part of our DNA. Is we never um, use and monetize our customer data. Hmm. So, uh, and that's keeping, and that's in our contract, in fact. Um, and um, um, let me uh, think about it. How to um, to phrase it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you asked me the question about uh, what about your uh, your customer? They sell to consumer and they can do what they want. And in fact, that's um, what, what we are also working on because we propose algorithm, AI algorithm, but we also uh, are doing developing the, the, the project with our um, customer. Mm. And that's part of uh, our consulting approach. Um, we, um, 
secure the fact that uh, the data um, and the, the services proposed by our customer will also be ethical. That's also in our guideline principles when we support a customer uh, to build an AI project. Okay, so, because, yeah, exactly. That was my, my next question. And from what I understand is that you're only selling to businesses, so yeah. you're never going to be selling to an end user like customer. Yeah. Uh, and so you kind of are once removed from the ability even to be collecting all of this data on the customer side. But the question was, like the next question is, okay, but how do you ensure that the people that you're selling to are also mm. being ethical about how they use all of this power that they now have? Right, and so yeah. you have a, a a strict guideline, and if they don't follow norms, then you don't engage with them. How does that look? Yeah, it's it's more in the the the, the principle of the um, the project. Most of the time, we uh, build with our, our customer their AI strategy or how AI will uh, help them transform their, themselves, innovate, propose mm-hmm. new services. And then fr- from that, this is, the, I mean, from the, the design of what we are proposing, uh, we think about how we will collect data, how will we secure those data, mm-hmm. uh, how we will make sure that they are anonymized when we test it. Because when you... Um, when you you build, in fact, you don't you use an AI algorithm, uh, but uh, you have to train it with. Um, uh, the, and we will talk about that later. Um, but first, this database uh, is an extract of usually their current customer database, for example, or other mm-hmm. database. Um, when we do this first training, we anonymize the uh, the data. Uh-huh. That's uh, so our team will never have access to uh, our customer data. So and that's just the beginning. But uh, at every step of the project, we think about data security. This is embedded in our approach. Uh, in fact. That's and really interesting. Yeah. And it has to be that way, this, because this is a kind of a cultural approach. You, um, you educate them on the risk from the beginning. And have uh, you found... Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry to cut you off. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. And, uh, just just one, one thing also, um, because that means that when we are starting a project with a customer, um, we start from scratch. We don't use, for example, data. If I work for um, an airline company, I won't use data from another airline to build and train AI. I will start from scratch, so it's longer, but it's safer. And so, it's so that's isolated. an ethical, yeah, that's an ethical, that's part of our principle, the way we work. So, which is not always the case, I won't. <laughs> not going <laughs> not gonna to throw anybody under the bus, but no. others don't do it like that. Yeah, and it exactly. makes complete sense that you want to be as ethical as you can when it comes to, okay, these teams, even though we're using the same, uh, we're in the same sector, we're in the same vertical, and this team has worked with Delta, and this team is working with Southwest, yeah. we're not going to share this data. And even if you wanted to, it sounds like, it wouldn't matter because all of the data that is being used by IBM from Delta, it is uh, autonomized or it's uh, anonymous, anonymized, if that's anonymized, a word. Anonymized, yes. Yeah. But and um, we also we can do that because uh, we usually have um, all the. Um, all the steps, meaning we have the AI algorithm, we have the, the project team, and also we usually provide the, the cloud and the environment mm. uh, to run those data. Um, and we ensure that it's uh, really um, autonomous and independent from 
any other client, of course. And again, that's in the contract. Uh -huh. And so it's like, because you own the whole life cycle, yeah. you're able to guarantee that. That exactly. also makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering, could you tell us, maybe you don't know, but how did this become such an ethos for IBM and when did this happen? Was this something that was from the beginning? I think IBM started in the 60s, right? Or the 70s? Or uh, we have actually, we have now uh, 109 years. So. Oh wow, even way, <laughs> way before I thought. Yeah. Yeah, 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 a long time ago. And in fact, that's from the beginning. Hmm. That's from the. Uh, that's why I was saying it's in our DNA because uh, from the first day, uh, that was uh, the position of our founder uh, Thomas Watson. Hmm. So uh, that and uh, I mean, ethic uh, inclusion was also uh, from day one part of uh, um, our uh, value at IBM. And so. With this idea, I'm sure that 109 years ago, Thomas Watson could have never foreseen the world that we're living in now. Mm. How was this idea kind of guided along the years? How did it make sure to stay with the company? Hmm. Um, this is difficult to say, but... Um, I think it goes with the evolution of this society. Um, I, I can't really tell about ethics, but I, I can tell about inclusion. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in the US, uh, we were one of the first large companies to hire women. Then we were one of the first companies to hire uh, disabled people. Then uh, LGBT people. So, and it's uh, I mean, it's going and going, and it's uh, it's um, always improving. And just a a, a quick um, uh, anecdote. Um, recently, I think it was last week, uh, we officially apologized because uh, one of our employees was a transgender person. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it was, I think it was 20 or 30 years ago, we fired her. Oh. And um, we, so we are not perfect, <laughs> that happens. But we officially uh, apologize uh, for that. So uh, we are progressing, and I mean, this is always in the value. So, um, and I think uh, ethic is the same. In fact, it's always in our mind. We always try to do our best for that. And um, we have every employee is trained every year and has to certify every year uh, on his uh, ethical behavior inside oh, wow. and outside IBM. Oh, wow. So it's a very big part of the culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh. because that's, that's also a differentiator, I think. But it's, I mean, yeah, it's in our DNA. And also it's a differentiator in the market. So. And so that was kind of the, the next question that I was going to ask is, how has IBM stayed clean all these years? <laughs> and you have other companies like Google doing all of their surveillance capitalism stuff. You have Microsoft with their Taybot and yeah. uh, Amazon with their sexist AI. There's so many ways that it can go wrong. And yeah. it seems that a IBM has stayed out of that spotlight. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how that has been possible? I think because the, the, uh, it comes from the, the way we think AI as I said, um, we think AI to augment people. Mm -hmm. We do not think AI to replace people. The, so that means, for example, for the, 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 the Microsoft bots, um, it was designed to uh, learn by itself with no human in intervention. And we see it becomes just a nightmare yeah. in, uh, in, in, in less than two days. So... But um, we don't think it that way. We are not 
building like AI project for for AI to take on decision by uh, by itself. Um, oh, it's funny because um, uh, often people ask me um, uh, how AI take the decision, but AI doesn't take any decision. Uh, AI propose always propose a probability of the best what could be the best decision in a specific case, mm. but it won't take a decision. Um, the human will take the decision based on the probability proposed by and the, the different choice proposed by the algorithm. Uh, so let's jump in to regulation a bit. And yeah. I know we mentioned before that the the idea of regulation, I just want to hear your thoughts on it, maybe just a broad uh, idea of what what you feel is happening with regulation and AI, and, and then we'll dive into that a bit more. Okay, so um, as you probably know, uh, the European Commission um, has done a, an assessment across uh, 2020 on uh, the uh, both the, the, the risk and the, the um, regulation possibilities uh, around AI, and um, it will be presented to the to the Commission for regulation in the first quarter of 2021. And uh, they envisage a different uh, scenario, a kind of a, an approach with uh, labeling um, AI um, based on their um, uh, ethical level or based on their, um, uh, their risk. Uh, there is also... The question is, do we need regulation uh, for AI? As uh, we know, it's going s super fast <laughs> and uh, and regulation is not going that pace. Uh, so this is really, um, we have to find the balance um, for that. Um, but uh, there is a specific field, like for example, uh, facial recognition, uh, by uh, everything around biometrics, um, so the commission is looking at something specific around that, and I think that's a good thing. I don't know if you hear, but um, we recently uh, announced that uh, we won't uh, sell our facial recognition uh, algorithm. Um, uh, I mean, in um, Publicly, I would say. So uh, we will uh, use it and, and um, um, agree to use it really when we know it will be used in ethical, um, in an ethical context. So we want absolutely to avoid that our facial recognition algorithm is used uh, for um, tracking uh, people. Um, I mean, uh, and this was um, uh, this was uh, during the, the the recent event in, in the US uh, uh -huh. a few few months ago. So uh, I definitely think that visual recognition uh, is an area with kind of say high risk, and we, we need mm -hmm. to regulate that. And um, also, I don't know. If we'll probably talk about China, but um, yeah. <laughs> we'll dive into that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, visual recognition is used um, everywhere um, over there. And um, then meaning that there is a risk for um, freedom. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. There, How do so, you feel are yeah. ways that facial recognition can be used ethically? Because when I think of all the different ways that they're being used now... I just think of the bad ways. Yeah, but uh, you mentioned um, uh, a video that uh, one of our researchers, um, so her name is uh, Kiko, uh, she became blind at the age of, uh, I think it was 10, around that. And uh, um, she has developed uh, an app um, mm. um, which allow her to recognize people when she walk uh, by someone and 
So uh, the app is um, using facial recognition to say, oh, that's Mary coming to you, uh, waving her hand. And uh, so Kiko hear that in, uh, with her headphone and she can say, hey, Mary, how are you today? Uh, or uh, so enabling social interaction. Um, and also uh, she used... Um, Oh, I mean, uh, it's not uh, facial recognition, but visual recognition to uh, decide how to uh, choose uh, her clothes every day, uh, choose her meal. Uh, so um, you have, and this is just one example, but you have plenty of use cases when uh, visual and facial recognition especially uh, could be useful for uh, people. So, yeah, that's why. And that's why it's so difficult to, to regulate um, because the same algorithm could be used for very different reasons. So that's why I think there is a need for kind of a regulation uh, around, yeah, biometric and visual recognition. Well, Another, yeah, oh, sorry. I, <laughs> I, was, I just instantly think about the fact that it's great that IBM is doing stuff like this and it feels to me like it's a, it's a necessary tool that needs to be out there. But then I also think like the cynical side of me thinks, well, there's no real money in that. And so you're not going to get these gigantic, uh, like it's not going to be, <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is companies are going to try to do things that aren't so ethical, where there is more money in it. Yeah, but uh, I was just using a, a, an example, I agree, where mm. there could be not so much money. But if you take the example of uh, airport, an airline company, mm. using facial recognition will allow uh, people to get to, to the plane um, um, really uh. faster, because uh, you, it will just recognize you um, and your identity is linked to your, to your face. So uh, you will go through the, the, the security, uh, the boarding really quickly. Um, and then that means that the rotation of the plane will be quicker. That means more money. Mm -hmm. that makes so, sense. so there's, yeah. And, th and that's a good point. That's a, that's a fair point that you mentioned. And, um, and in every AI project, you have to uh, balance what is the investment and what is the, um, the business case and decide uh, whether it's good to, I mean, it's worth it to go or not. And I must say, most of the, uh, a lot of the time, it's not worth it because um, mm. building AI is not a kind of one shot project is you have to train it and train it uh, all over the time. So uh, otherwise it's not used, it's, it becomes obsolete very quickly. So um, it, it's always a balance between the, the, the ROI, you can, uh, you can find that. Yeah, completely. And I'm wondering about this airport example again. It's a great example for what life could be like. Mm -hmm. Right. And we none of us like waiting in lines for yeah. in the US say they're called TSA agents and they give you the stamp or they look at your ID and they look at you and hmm, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And it would be amazing if we could just go through and not have to wait in that line and just go through security without any of that. I just wonder how the approval or how people will feel about the airport having that data on them. And I guess what we've seen in the historic events is that people don't really care. If it makes their life easier, they're fine with giving up their data and whatever. You can have anything you want. Just give me some cool apps on my phone and I'm yeah. good to go. But, uh, but as we move forward and this becomes more and more of something that people understand and they're really they're aware of the fact that, okay, yeah, I am able to move through the airport more quickly, but I'm also giving, it's because they scan my face and they know about this. So 
I look at it as like, okay, do you feel that there's going to be some kind of stamp of approval getting back to the governance piece of this? Yeah. Are certain places that are using these facial ID or the facial recognition, are they going to need to pass different standardization governance and how will that play out? Because like you said, it's moving so quickly that maybe this airport wants to implement a new algorithm that's going to make things much easier and much better. But because of regulation moving slower, it is not able to. Yeah, so, um, and it's a really interesting topic uh, because um, when you go to Asia today, um, you they they uh, take a picture of you uh, already, uh, and you if you want to go to Asia, there's no choice. You have to go through uh, the custom, and the custom will take a picture of you and will link it to your ID. So uh, and people still can keep on going to Asia. <laughs> so uh, not asking any question. You have no choice. In fact, yeah. Um, this is China specifically, right? Or is it no, everywhere in Asia? No, I've been to many uh, countries in South Asia and it's almost oh. uh, everywhere over there. I mean, um, Thailand, um, Indonesia, Myanmar, um, mm. most of those are, are doing that already. Uh, Hong Kong, Singapore, of course. And uh, if I recall correctly, Japan as well. Mm -hmm. Um so, but that's why I think in the EU we need a specific regulation for that. Um, it has to be um, kind of a, a govern um, in a way that is transparent uh, and that mm -hmm. the, 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 the regulator can uh, audit regularly. And so, and that's, I, I agree, that's the difficult part. It, uh, th this kind of framework uh, has to be able to uh, evolve uh, within the time because we will invent for sure <laughs> new ways. Um, but we absolutely need a, a, a kind of a, a regulation around that. And where I have hope is that when we first in the EU created the RGPD, it was only, it was at the beginning, it was only for, for EU. But now we see that other country and mainly the, the, the US, uh, um, they are also using this regulation now. Mm -hmm. So maybe, and I think that's kind of our role um, in Europe to, to show the way, to lead the way um, um, and setting regulation uh, that will uh, spread across the globe, uh, at least the, the, the west side of the globe, I hope. Mm -hmm. And uh, will be, we know it will be more difficult um, in, uh, in, in China mm -hmm. or uh, other Asian people, uh, Asian countries, sorry. And along those lines, is there something that you feel that, like, there's a difference between... because the way that we look at the world culturally, and you see there's so much difference in, in Asia, uh, the way that they look at the world culturally in the US and, and Europe. And I'm wondering, just as again, as another tangent <laughs> that I seem to be going on a lot of today, there is there something that you feel is different in the way that IBM France conducts itself as opposed to IBM in other places like in the US or the UK? Um, in the AI field, um, I didn't really felt, um, a difference in our approach. Um, yeah, um, I mean, it, we don't have this same, uh, regulation, uh, which applies, but, um, no, I must say uh, it was kind of a. It was kind of the, the the. It was kind of the same. Of course, it was not the, the same culture. It was not the same. Uh, almost not almost the same company. Uh, but um, the, the the value were the same. Yeah. Interesting. 
Okay. So, yeah, jumping back on this idea about regulation and how you're seeing things move so fast. The other thing that I just wanted to mention is we had uh, Sebastian on here about by the time people are listening to this, it will be one of the first episodes in, in the first season. And he spoke about how there's so many specific use cases. And that's kind of what he, he didn't actually, I don't think he said he feared that, but that was one thing that he said is going to make things so difficult with the regulation. So can you speak about that at all? Like just how many different use cases we have with AI and how you hope to see regulation help? Or is that just going to be something that is on the companies? No, I think... Um the I think the the, the use cases are uh, somehow unlimited, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, I mean the algorithm uh, the uh, we we created we developed it, uh, it was like um, in the eighties and we are always using the same but we always train it train it in a different way so I mm-hmm. think the use cases uh, yeah are unlimited. But what we can do for regulation is to build kind of a framework of um, defining what is a high risk application yeah. uh, and specifically regulate those high risk applications. So we, we talked about um, facial recognition, but there is another uh, really important topic here is when we use AI to... Um, seeded our judgment and choice yeah. and um, and decision. And for me, that's a really absolutely key topic. And it's a kind of um, you don't you don't see that really. I, I will give you an example. Uh, we are working using AI and also um, IoT for um, to make the maintenance uh, more efficient uh, for plane, train, cars, everything. So what we do is we um, usually we have uh, we have sensors, but we can. Uh, have also uh, a technician take um, a picture of a, um, uh, of a uh, I don't know uh, an engine, for example, yeah. and then the AI will recognize the different uh, pieces and say, oh, this one has a particular um, use uh, using tears, so it, it it needs to be replaced, or it needs to be replaced in the coming next three months, and then we plan the, uh, for example, if, for, if it's uh, a train, a boat, or a plane, the, the next stop where this uh, spare part is is uh, in this country, and uh, uh, with the uh, the schedule, you will be, um, uh, the engine will be in this country within two months, and it will be okay, etc. Mm-hmm. So, b- linking all those uh, information. But that means that um, when the technician will take the picture and look at the engine, today, uh, people, technicians, usually they have the experience. So they can uh, look at the engine by themselves and say, oh, no, I, I know this. I've, uh, it won't... Uh, it won't last for two months. We have to replace it now. Uh-huh. Okay. So don't trust what AI is saying. Uh, so, for example, because AI will, the algorithm will, um, will say <laughs> um, probability to have to change this, uh, this part uh, within two months is 76%. Mm-hmm. So either you have experienced people who can judge by themselves um, if they, it's, it will, if it really will last two months or much more than that or a bit less than that. So they will still use their experience and judgment to take their decision. But when it's come to the new technician who, with no experience, with mm-hmm. only the AI yeah. tool, 
looking at the, the, the picture uh, saying 76 percent, he was like, okay, let's do that. And so you want, the uh, people won't use their, their mind, their critical sense, because it will be used all the time to trust AI, whatever. Mm-hmm. And for me, that's a absolutely critical uh, to um, educate people uh, to teach them how to keep absolutely their critical sense at all times and their mm-hmm. own judgment and their own decision. Even though it's, I know, just so much more easy to trust what AI is recommending. Yeah. So, so long true. story short, <laughs> but uh, um, definitely for me, high risk application where you see your judgment and decision, uh, this is a key area to regulate. And there are so many different applications of that. And I love this application that you talk about because it's very high stakes, right? Like if an airplane has a bad screw, that could mean a very dangerous situation. And so when you have new technicians that are coming onto the field and they've learned with AI, then like you say, it's very easy to just trust what the computer is telling you and Mm -hmm. not think for yourself and a lot of other people on the podcast have spoken a lot about in Florida with the judges that Mm. get given recommendations on if someone should be going to jail or not or how long they should go to jail if they're going to reoffend and that again is something that is so dangerous to just put all of your faith into because we know that like you said, it's not perfect at all and it's very far from it. And there are a lot of use cases where AI, yeah, maybe it's novel and it's nice and it's ideally in our heads when we think of the future, we think, yeah, this is it. We're here. We've accomplished this great feat and now I can take a picture and it can tell me, like the other day I was uh, out hiking and I was taking pictures of mushrooms because Mm -hmm. I wanted to find mushrooms that I could eat. And (laughs) not the magic kind. I know somebody's going to (laughs) probably say (laughs) something in the comments about that, but just the normal, like there's uh, porcini mushrooms around where I live. And so there's an app where you can take pictures of the mushrooms and it tells you that, okay, this mushroom might be this or that. And I think it's cool, but knowing what I know about machine learning, I don't trust it enough to eat the mushrooms. <laughs> like I, I have enough of a sense of, yeah, this algorithm might be flawed. I just like taking the pictures and saying like, oh, this is this kind of mushroom or this is the other kind, whatever it is. But I still, if I do take a picture of a mushroom that is like, yeah, you can eat this, I still don't touch it because of that reason, like it's just giving a percent confidence that it might be this, but you're not actually going to get uh, that hundred percent like, yes, it's this ever, I think, uh, at least where we stand right now. Yeah. And um, yeah, I don't think we will reach the hundred percent. That's not the the, the way it's built. And uh, unfortunately, otherwise, uh, it could lead to, okay, if it's 100%, then we don't need to have a human yeah, to no do question. it. No question. So do it. And that become very dangerous. And yeah. I want to uh, go back to the example that you were saying about uh, the judges. Mm-hmm. That's really um, a key point because... Um, if they usually, and that's what I see almost in every project, um, to train the algorithm, um, usually we use the historical data. Yeah. Meaning that for judges, if the historical data are biased, and we know it is, mm-hmm. um, the AI will just amplify that. Uh, and in terms of taking a just a decision, I mean, that's a, a human life uh, that mm-hmm. is at stake. It's really, really dangerous. Really. Yeah, exactly. It's the mm. high stakes that we talk about. And yeah. another thing that we mentioned, I think 
when Sebastian was on, I keep referring back to that podcast. So if anybody hasn't listened to it, go and check it out. It's, it's very much in line with what we're talking about today. But his research found that humans are much more likely on average to just believe and trust whatever the computer says is yeah. true. And that's because I think we've been brought up with calculators that can do the square root of, you know, 576 and it tells us the exact number. And yeah. there's no question on that, right? That we look at that and whatever this crazy math um, formula that we put into our calculator, it mm -hmm. comes out with an answer, which is a fact. Yeah. But with algorithms like AI and machine learning, we don't get that same kind of fact that comes out of the computer. But since we are made to believe that it's coming from a computer, then we just automatically place our faith in it much easier than if it were another human telling us. We can just like think about if another human told us, oh, okay, yeah, like judging by all of the data that I've looked at, this person should go to jail. I think we would all be a little bit skeptical of like, okay, so what data did you look at and where did you get this data and who were these people in these data sets, right? Like, it's just not something that we would take at face value if it was a human, but if it is a computer, for some reason, we're more easily fooled. Yeah, and I think it will be worse and worse because I can see my kids, uh, they are, I mean, they are uh, always on the YouTube or on their uh, social uh, media, and they that's what they trust. Mm -hmm. Even usually what they do is they, they are going to school, and then if um, they said, oh, well, I didn't understand, and they will look at YouTube to find another course on the same topic to, mm -hmm. to learn. Um, so for them, uh, YouTube is the, <laughs> the truth. Uh, yeah. so I think we have, for me, that's, um, an area where we definitely have to find a way to ed absolutely educate people. Hmm. And, yeah. and this goes back more to education, not regulation, yeah. right? This yeah. is something that, like you said, at IBM, you're getting ethics training, every year mm -hmm. and this is something that I feel like should be included in that ethics training or it should be at least noted but not all companies are IBM right not all companies have this ethos so how can we go about educating people that okay yeah what you see on YouTube maybe it will help you maybe it won't you need to be very critical about what you're taking in and the information you're taking in and I think that's becoming something that is more noticed and it is a very big necessity for our education system, the teachers to teach our children and even our adults yeah. how to be critical of this information that we're getting, whether that's on Facebook or YouTube or just a blog post. Yeah, and so um, what we are doing on education, um, we have several initiatives because this is um, really, again, at the, the, the core of the uh, uh, interest and uh, engagement of IBM. Uh, we have, I don't know if you heard about uh, P-TECH. Um, no. Uh, um, our uh, chairman, uh, I mean, um, Gina Rometti, she, she, will, uh, she will retire at the end of the year, but uh, she created a few years ago um, uh, uh, what we call an initiative called PTAC, and uh, that's where we um, usually in um, uh, in poor uh, environments uh, we work with um, high school to um, and we dedicate mentor uh, so. IBMers to uh, help and to uh, educate, to teach uh, to the 
to the children, what is technology, what is mm. um, life in a bank company, uh, they, 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 they come uh, in training in the company, etc. And this is uh, really dedicated to environment when, uh, where they don't have uh, this um, kind of education. So, and in France, we have opened the uh, like fifth, uh, the fifth PTEC class, um, meaning that uh, because we keep on year and year, uh, so it's a kind of a three to five year program. So we have now like uh, 200 children that we are supporting in this um uh, education to what is technology, what is not technology, what you, you can trust, what you can't, and uh, familiarize them uh, as well with uh, uh, this uh, this word. And that's one initiative. We are uh, in France also working with um, Institut Montaigne. It's a think tank and the open classroom. I don't know if you oh, know cool. this startup. Uh, we have built an um, uh, AI um, education for everyone. I mean, uh, it's open to public, it's free, and it teach you of what is AI okay. um, from really the basic uh, where you can find AI uh, in your daily life and what you need to be careful of or pay attention to. Yeah, so, teaching people that there's a big difference between your calculator and a machine learning recommendation, recommendation system. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, well, Anne, I know we've gone over. I'm sorry for keeping you. I hope you didn't have a hard stop right now, but I really want to thank you so much for talking to me and enlightening us on what IBM's doing, your personal views on things, and how you see the world. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Demetrius. It was a pleasure. And I so much topic that we didn't talk about. That uh... <laughs> We may have to come on here for another time. We'll do a yeah. round two. Okay. Yeah, for sure. There is a lot that we wanted to get into. And time just got, got out of our hands, didn't it? <laughs> but it was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you later, everyone. See you later.